And, you know, when you, you talk about different ways to get instruction level parallelism, the, uh, you know, what we're, what we're kind of talking about, and this is with risk and CISC as well, perhaps, uh, is do you do more work in the hardware or do you push more complexity to the hardware or do you push it into the compiler? And, you know, the way computing systems have evolved have changed that trade off. So some of the discussions, you know, looking back at things in the 70s and 80s, um, you know, assumptions about, for instance, you mentioned a human, you know, writing a program. It's it's very different when you're you're comparing that to a compiler generating machine code. Um, so that's you know one of the things that I frequently see with some of the research from uh, back in that time, and then applying it today. Um, that's just one vector where the trade offs may have changed. You know throughout history, the um, the architecture the the processor that you referenced in that talk um, that kind of uh, gave VLIW a bad name was Itanium, uh, which I'm sure uh, a number of folks uh, are familiar with. Um, so with VLIW, we can potentially reduce the complexity um, uh, of the processor, right? Because we're, we're pushing more of that onto the compiler. Can you talk about why Itanium was not successful in doing that or, or why it's maybe mocked today? Yeah. Um, well, as I mentioned in that talk, and I'll stick to my, my stance here, I, I do not consider, um, uh, you know, this is trying to like disown a, a, not even my own child, but something that gets associated with the thing that I love. Right. Um, but uh, I, I do not consider ita Itanium, Itanic to, to be a VLIW architecture. Um, and my best evidence or, or thing I can point to support that um, is Intel's own marketing from the time. Uh, which they were very explicitly trying to say that it wasn't VLIW back then. Um, they they coined this epic name, so it's the explicitly parallel, you know, instruction set computer. And um, I appreciate whoever in the marketing department uh, at that time, uh, you know, w was doing that. Um, <laughs> and but even the the you know technical reasoning for doing that was their belief that they could actually take the really powerful, amazing thing about VLIW of being able to have these explicitly encoded uh, uh, parallel or concurrent operations that could be done. And I would say they had a bit of, um, and you know, uh, I, I've heard different stories from different people involved at the time, but in general, I think everyone would agree that um, there were strong battles internally in the both Itanium team itself, but you know, being heavily, heavily constrained and influenced by other parties within Intel that were really trying to heavily push the, uh, uh, you know, x86 Pentium continuation elements. And what I think the real downfall for, for Itanium in, in diverging from sort of the pure VLIW roots, which have ended up being successful in many other products that we'll, we'll talk about, but um, was them trying to still have support and, and some level of compatibility with, with x86 and mm. all the um, uh, elements and, and kitchen sink pieces that were getting moved in from other parts of Intel and being bolted onto to Itanium that kind of turned it into not being VLIW and I would say very much being epic uh, and, and turning out to be an epic fail. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, I, I just, you know, to, to explain, I guess expand a little bit on it, it's um, fundamentally comes down to what I was saying before, where VLIW is the programmer, the compiler, whoever, whatever is uh, uh, giving that instruction. It's its job to actually be saying that um, we know at this pers at this cycle that you're going to be having um, uh, no control or data hazards with this, this data you're providing. And when you start to try to add a lot of, you know, advanced processor features like branching, um, uh, or branch prediction, um, you know, any sort of caching systems, um, and especially if you want to actually have some instruction compatibility with x86, which was a big and goal that Intel never actually even delivered on with with Itanium. Um, uh, you add in so much requirements of non-deterministic uh, features that that guarantee can't be made. It's it's right. impossible. Like if uh, um, the 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 delusion and the the reason I uh, think that I, the Itanium failure is so uh, well known by people that aren't computer architects and but that they still associate it as VLIW bad because of uh, Itanium um, don't realize that 
it wasn't that they just weren't able to make a sufficiently smart compiler. That was a impossible task. It's, mm -hmm. I, I would say, um, probably not provable as impossible. Like you know, p is is or is not equal to, to n p. I would say it's similarly um, non-determinable, but any rational person, I think, would be saying that P is not equal to NP. And if it was, then the whole world collapse and none, none of us, no, nothing we say about it matters if it was. And so I would make a similar assertion that um, Itanium's you know, mythical magical compiler was impossible due to all of the non-VLIW cruft and, and design directions that they, they tried to, to do it to make it a... Um, Appeal, appealing product from Intel's internal perspective. And um, fundamentally, I think that those those decisions were rooted in Intel didn't want to actually um, diverge from, from x86.